I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, uh, my name is Peter Walker from the Geography Department of Environmental Studies Program. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Mary Wood from the University of Oregon Law School. Uh, Mary has, uh, was a graduate of the University of Washington in political science uh, and received her um, Juris Doctor uh, from Stanford University and her uh, uh, CV and list of publications is just way too long for me to even attempt to, uh, to tackle, so I'm going to instead share a uh, small anecdote if you can bear with me. Uh, and this is something you can put on your CV, Mary. I don't know if you know about this. But uh, for m now more than 20 years, uh, I've been associated with the uh, Environmental Studies Program, and I've been teaching the uh, introductory course in Environmental Studies called Introduction to Environmental Studies from <laughs> a social science perspective. And uh, my unofficial title for that class is um, How Smart People Do Dumb Things to the Planet. <laughs> and what we might be able to do about it. And it's pretty easy to talk about the uh, how smart people do dumb things to the planet part. It's often been a much bigger challenge to talk about what we can do about it, and that's actually been reflected over the years in student evaluations where I get comments like, well, that was an eye-opening course, but now I'm convinced that we're doomed and I'm really depressed. <laughs> um, and so I've attempted over the years to add in material that seems hopeful. And a few years ago, as you can see, the, the book um, that Mary published in 2013 uh, is something I've been using. Mary spoke in my class and about the idea of public trust doctrine applied to uh, environmental law. And um, now I get comments that say things like, well, actually, maybe there's hope after all. <laughs> and last uh, term, I had the great pleasure of uh, having in that class uh, Kelsey Giuliana, who uh, is an undergraduate in, uh, in environmental studies. Um, and she, along with 20 other youth plaintiffs, uh, including one other U of O environmental studies undergraduate, are on a major lawsuit that uh, Mary has helped uh, to guide from the beginning. And uh, it's, uh, you know, ordinarily I'm a little skeptical about the uh, U of O's public relations department when they say <laughs> things like uh, the biggest lawsuit on the planet. <laughs> In this case, I think that's probably not an exaggeration. I think this is a critically important um, test of our legal systems, our, and for that matter, our system of government's ability to tackle our responsibility to uh, other human beings and to other future generations on our planet. It's a pretty major accomplishment that it's gotten as far as it has, and. Um, it's going to be, and the fact that it's still alive in the legal system and working its way forward really is and should be a cause for hope. So with that, I'll thank Mary for all of her work and hand it over. Oh, thank you. Um, you can all sit, anyone who comes in can sit up front if you want. Well, I'm so pleased to be here. What a cool room, and thank you so much for coming to talk about the planet and what we can all do about climate crisis. And, um, the plan is I'm going to spend a couple minutes on just talking about the scale of our thinking and then I'm going to um, deliver the slideshow presentation and then our wonderful friend who's videotaping me is going to cut off the video and then we'll talk about um, very exciting updates off camera but the, the video portion will be on the web. So um, I just want to start by saying um, that we've got to really fast forward our thinking when we're working on climate and all of us need to be working on climate right now because <laughs> We are sort of at that point, we're heading towards Niagara Falls. And every one of us is in that boat. And if you're not thinking about climate and doing things about climate and trying to help as you can every single day in every single way, uh, you're just sort of riding on that raft heading towards Niagara <coughs> Falls with the rest of us. And so when we're working on climate, um, we've got to really think ludicrously ambitious thoughts. The scale of our ambition must match the scale of the threat. And I'll, I'll talk about the scale of the threat. It's basically a threat to all of our survival. And so what we have to do is somehow scale up our thinking and our vision 
and create real vision and then try to put into place the pathways to achieve that vision. Um, what a lot of people are still doing is just kind of doing the same things they've been doing for years and years or decades and decades. Um, but what is so inspiring is that a lot of people are actually really scaling up their thinking and they're fast forwarding their actions. In other words, we can't even uh, deal with the same time scales we've dealt with before. Some of the tools in the law from the Law Academy, you know, writing really long law review articles, there's not even time for that anymore. It's better to write grant proposals or brief sort of things that the public can read. Um, and so I just want to sort of enter this um, discussion by giving you this major caveat that what you're going to see is sort of scaled up and fast tracked, but that's our reality and that's what so many people around the planet are doing. And when they're doing that, it becomes very inspiring. It lifts us all out of the trenches of this um, kind of disaster mentality. So uh, what I'd like to do is just talk about matching this moment um, of law with reality. So uh, basically the law, if it's going to be relevant at all, and it's the law I teach, has to face the reality um, that we all confront. And if it doesn't do that in a big way, it is completely irrelevant in our crisis. Um, it has not faced reality very well. The only way it is intersecting with reality, in my opinion, is through these court cases, um, the one that, P that Peter um, mentioned and another that I'm gonna talk about uh, momentarily. Um, so what I will talk about mainly is atmospheric recovery litigation, but I'm going to preface that by going through the other cases, um, the case that you've heard about, um, and we'll start by talking about the climate emergency. So what are we facing? What are the needs of the climate system? That is the starting point. It's not what President Trump is gonna do. President Trump uh, is, is not the starting point. It's the starting, he's the starting point for a lot of people, but the starting point has to be what is the natural law governing our situation? What is the law of nature and what does our climate system actually need? And then I'll talk about this atmospheric trust litigation, which Professor Walker has mentioned. Um, and then this is the atmospheric recovery litigation, which has not yet been launched. This has been launched into a global litigation effort. Um, that is what the biggest case on the planet is part of, but this other one has not been launched but I hope it will be launched soon, and it anticipates suing the fossil fuel companies for natural resource damages to fund drawdown of carbon, fund a cleanup of the atmosphere. So, I always start from this quote. Justice Holmes said it right. The common law is the felt necessities of the times. The law should respond to that, not the politics. What are our necessities? I'm not gonna, I actually threw out all the slides which talk about how um, completely uh, devastating our uh, situation is, because I think you know it already. Um, if you don't know it, you can read this nice little bedtime article, uh, which was appeared last, uh, I think it was June, in the New York Magazine. And um, the quote really says it all from the author. <coughs> it is, I promise, worse than you think. But no matter how well informed you are, you are surely not alarmed <coughs> enough. The bottom line is that this climate emergency is projected to yield, if we don't jump off these lethal train tracks, <coughs> it's projected to create 9 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit warming over pre-industrial temperatures. Um, that, in a nutshell, is simply not survivable. So that's what you need to know. That's kind of the bottom line that if you wake up tomorrow and do what you did yesterday, and if we all do the same thing, that's called business as usual, B-A-U. And if we do that, we head towards nine to 11 degrees warming, which is not broadly survivable, okay? So for young people who have their lifespans extending out towards the end of the century, um, this should be their primary concern. It should be the concern of everybody on the planet. Um, there is urgency in this because of dangerous feedback loops and tipping points. And so many average Americans don't know about these. But there is a ticking time clock for our action because as the Earth warms, it causes feedback loops that, that create a worse situation. So just one I'll mention, which you probably know about, is the ticking time, so the carbon bomb in the uh, northern latitudes. As the Earth heats, and it's already heated, it melts the permafrost containing methane and carbon dioxide 
and it's already starting to melt at the northern latitudes, and if that melt really gets going, it's going to be an atmospheric tsunami of carbon and methane, and there's nothing we can do to safely pull back from that. It's going to be runaway heating, um, and we don't have anything to confront that other than some very radical geoengineering proposals, which I won't talk about yet. So we have a huge emergency. The former UN climate chief has said we only have three years, and that was said last June, to bend the curve of carbon emissions. Now, we don't have to bring it to zero within three years. The good news was that the carbon curve actually had leveled out for two years before President Trump came into office. Now it's going up. But we just have to bend it down and continue those rapid decarbonization measures. Um, but we have to do that while you're, many of you are still in college. What is our president doing? He is going the other direction, um, seeking to develop 50 trillion tons of oil, coal, natural gas. And so I think this very much depicts our situation. We had a world which supported our survival. It was a beautiful world, um, beautiful natural areas that we've come to know and take for granted. And where we are is right here. We're between the two worlds of a world that supported our survival and a world that is deadly. So it would be very nice to have a leader, sort of a world leader, to provide leadership in this crisis. Um, it'd be nice to have a president to provide leadership. We didn't even have it in the time of President Obama. His major science advisor at the time said, the current situation in the world in relation to the climate problem is that we're in a car with bad brakes driving towards a cliff in the fog. All of us are in that car. But we're in the back seat. And now we've got a president who has his foot on the accelerator and is just pressing down as hard as he can towards that cliff. And we're in the back seat of that car. And our children are in the back seat of that car. And everybody in the world is in the back seat of that car. And so the question for you as I talk about the law, and I'm, I'm going to talk about courts, the question for you is you're heading towards this cliff in the fog with a maniac driver. Do you want a police officer to pull over that car before we go plunging over the cliff? That police officer isn't, officer isn't going to say where the car is going to go. It's going to say go backwards, but it's not going to say which direction. But do you want, do you want some, someone to intervene before that car goes yes. over the cliff? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my job is to figure out, <laughs> figure out how do you take this legal system, which has been completely dysfunctional in the legislative and executive branches and is pushing that car over the cliff? How do you take a legal system and try to catalyze some sort of police officer pulling over the car in time? That's, that's the job of lawyers. And I'm actually not a litigator. Um, I only think of strategies. And then the real heroes in this um, case that we're going to talk about are the actual lawyers and the plaintiffs. They are doing the amazing work, not me. So here's what the planet needs. We need to uh, get back to 350 parts per million to stabilize the climate. We are in well over 400 parts per million. I don't even, um, I don't even anymore update the slide because we're just still going up and up. Um, but it needs a two-part response according to the best climate scientists. Number one, we need to decarbonize by 2050. So we need to get off fossil fuels and convert to renewable safe energy, and I don't include nuclear in that, but renewable safe energy by 2050. Can it be done? Yes, the policy analysts and the climate analysts say yes, it can be done. Second, we need to draw down the surplus carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by at least 100 gigatons. That's huge. That's the focus of the um, atmospheric recovery litigation I said hadn't yet been launched. But we're going to pause just for a moment on this first. I'm going to tell you how this decarbonization challenge is playing out in the courts. So <clears throat> Dr. James Hansen, the former head of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, you've all probably heard of him, developed at my request a prescription to lower carbon dioxide emissions in time to avoid tipping points. And so what he did with leading scientists around the world in a peer-reviewed study he made measurements of how, how steep this curve of emissions reduction would have to be. Because um, I you know, asked him, we need numbers. We need to 
be able to go to mayor's offices and courts and legislatures saying you have to reduce this amount per year. Does that make sense to everybody? Because if you just say to a court, we want 350, that's not going to do anything. You need a, a, you need a pathway down. Everybody can see that, right? So they developed a pathway and they said, had we started in 2005, we could have achieved um, climate stability with the other measures and decarbon decarbonize by 2050. And that wouldn't have been so tough. But government didn't act, including our own Oregon State Legislature, has not acted, even though it's been asked four to five times in a very comprehensive way by Oregon um, citizens. And so the number goes up as you wait. It was 7% in 2015. And here is the mind-blowing number, 15% a year by 2020. Now that's assuming 100 gigatons of drawdown. So as we miss these numbers, more goes into the sky and there's more we have to clean up. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so now we're gonna get to the drawdown. What can we do in terms of drawdown? Because there's already excess carbon dioxide in the sky. Um, we're already at 400 parts per million. We have to be at 350, so that means we have to clean up 50 parts per million or more. Um, so how do we do that? Well, the good news is there's actually great potential on the part of nature to accomplish a huge kickstart of the drawdown. We may need technology later on. But through re reforestation, wetlands and mangrove restoration, regenerative agriculture and regenerative grazing, and some other methods, you can actually scrub carbon out of the atmosphere because plants naturally absorb carbon and store it in the soil. And so scientists all over the world are working on these methods, including scientists at this university. So now, with that, you kind of know what the Earth climate system needs, and now it's up to us to develop and implement a legal strategy for that. So um, I came to this problem actually figuring out after many, many years of work that the legislative and executive branches were completely dysfunctional in the realm of environmental law. It's because they're just captured by major industries. Major industries contribute to campaigns, and so they're too politicized to accomplish really anything. And that held true for the Obama administration as well as Republican administrations. <coughs> it's, of course, off the charts with the Trump administration. I mean, with the Trump administration, environmental law is pretty much dissolved. So I went to, the, um, to thinking about the third branch. The third branch is the only last branch we have. Every day I sort of wake up and think, how many branches of government do we have? And today I still thought we still had three. Uh, <laughs> we'll hope it's still three um, as we move through this presidency. But anyway, um, so we still have the courts. And the courts are present at the state and federal levels and in every country across, across the earth, almost every country. And so I thought of a, an approach to take climate crisis to the courts, not using statutory law, which had failed, but using really the most ancient principle of environmental law known to countries around the world. It's called the public trust. And the public trust is just really basic. It's a principle of law. We don't have to invent it. It's there. It's been, it's been there since the inception of our country. It's been announced in cases, including the Supreme Court of the United States, and every single state in this country has announced the public trust. And it basically just means that the federal government is a trustee of our crucial natural resources. And as trustee, it manages them, you know, our waters, our wildlife, our airs, and so forth, our wetlands. Um, but as trustee, it can't just manage it as sort of um, a, a member of the royal family. It has to manage them for the beneficiaries, and the beneficiaries are the present and future generations of citizens. And so the trust concept is that, and it's a constitutional concept, is that courts can enforce trust obligations so that the um, legislative and executive branch manage these crucial survival resources for our benefit. And they must protect them for the endurance of society and for the benefit of future generations as well. That's all in the law. That's nothing I'm making up. It's just that when the statutes were passed in the 70s, Everybody just focused on those statutes, like the Clean Air Act and Clean Water Act. Those have not accomplished their purposes in a, in a very big way. Um, the Clean Air Act was always ready to regulate carbon dioxide, but still hasn't. And so I thought, well, maybe we can take the trust obligation, bring it to courts, and say that there is a trust obligation on the part of government to protect the climate. And this public trust, because it's known, it goes back to Roman law, 
So it's actually known to countries throughout the world. So it's sort of a unifying legal framework that courts can use in <coughs> Montana, Mississippi, Florida, India, Philippines, um, all over the world except for in tyrannies. And so this <coughs> spawned um, an atmospheric trust litigation campaign that is spearheaded by the group Our Children's Trust. And I'm not affiliated with that group, um, although I am part of a group of law professors that supports this litigation through amicus briefs. It's an incredible uh, nonprofit organization right here in Eugene. And they have brought a hatch of cases. And by hatch, I just mean um, cases throughout the country and other cases um, on the global level. And these have been brought on behalf of youth plaintiffs and petitioners against governments, asserting that those governments are trustees of the atmosphere, and that as trustees, they have a duty against allowing impairment of the climate system. Um, and they seek, they all seek the same thing, enforceable science-based climate recovery plans. And so what this envisions is courts overseeing decarbonization and drawdown, um, but overseeing the other two branches. So the other two branches come up with the measures, but the courts make sure that the uh, other two branches aren't pushing us over the cliff, but are instead backing up. So um, this is off the ground, and in 2015, after filing many, many cases, um, <clears throat> our Children's Trust filed just a, a historic lawsuit that is sitting in the Federal District Court of Oregon about a mile away from where we sit today. And it was filed in 2015, it's still pending, and basically, the um, plaintiffs and the attorneys had gathered up and assembled um, a huge story of how, using facts and reports and so forth and documents, showing how the federal government, through all its various agencies, had known for decades that the fossil fuel policy would put us in danger today. You can go back through reports that are widely available on the internet. Mm -hmm. You can read them for yourself. And it's absolutely incredible that back in the 80s, major governmental players were saying, and the industry, of course, was saying too, if we pursue fossil fuel policies, we compromise the ability of the Earth to support human survival. And these effects will start happening in around 2015. The problem was they weren't looking at you and seeing your actual faces they didn't really envision, it didn't sort of probably psychologically hit them that we would be real and suffering these incredible, extraordinary, and growing impacts. So they just kept on going. This, this uh, case is amazing because it challenges the entire fossil fuel policy of the United States of America. And why? Because nothing short of that will work in time. Literally, you can't, you can't challenge um, singular actions anymore. It won't add up in time. So it's a constitutional lawsuit, not a statutory lawsuit. And it, um, that's important because you have to have some legal approach that trumps Trump. If you don't have a legal approach that can trump Trump, then you go over that climate cliff because he's heading us towards that. You see what I mean? And also Congress. So Congress and the executive are always bound by the US Constitution and the fundamental rights of citizens. And so it is that kind of case that is sitting in the District Court of Oregon a mile away from here. It is not a statutory case which Congress can easily override. And, and it's not a regulatory case which the Trump administration can override. So it alleges, or asserts, a constitutional duty under the federal public trust principle to protect the atmosphere and climate system. It also serves the same duty under the Due Process Clause of the United States Constitution, which is supposed to protect our fundamental rights to life, liberty, and property. And it requests that court to oversee, force and oversee, a climate recovery plan which can, is comprised of both decarbonization and also drawdown. And that would be at the federal level. In 2016, November 10th, the District Court of Oregon gave a huge victory, sweeping victory, to the plaintiffs in this case. Um, the government and industry interveners had asked the court to dis dismiss the case. The court said no. The court said that it finds that plaintiffs do have a constitutional right under the public trust and also a constitutional right under the due process guarantee of life, liberty, and property. 
So this is a constitutional right that you and I all hold that had not been announced on the federal level until that date in 2016. And so now, you know, um, you can consider yourselves as participating in this litigation in the sense that, even though you're not named, you hold the same constitutional right to a stable climate system. Use it. Go forth with it. Um, this is what Judge Aiken said and wrote. I have no doubt that the right to a climate system capable of sustaining human life is fundamental to a free and ordered society. So people decades from now will look back on these words and say that was the legal turning point. Now, um, we're going to move forward. Oops, not that much forward. Sorry about that. Now the, tri the case is going into trial. And the trial is called, by many, the trial of the millennium because, again, it challenges the whole fossil fuel policy of the United States, and this will be the first time that that fossil fuel policy will actually meet climate science in court. In other words, everything you know about climate science has never really come square to square, faced up with fossil fuel policy. It will, and I hope all of you will be in that courtroom. Um, it's, the trial is uh, scheduled to last eight to ten weeks. They'll have the premier climate scientists from all over the world um, and hopefully people from this room and, and all of your communities will come and fill that courtroom um, day after day after day. Meanwhile, our Children's Trust is filing new cases. There was one filed recently in Florida. There's another recently filed in India. Um, filing cases against governments hoping that as the judges step up, the judicial dominoes will fall in time to avoid these catastrophic irrevocable planetary tipping points. There was a case recently filed, I think just last week, against the entire European Union by a group of citizens and children saying that the European Union was not doing enough. And so cases are coming forth globally and in this country and um, judges are stepping up because the Juliana lawsuit, because of the District Court of Oregon, that has inspired more cases to be brought on the global level. It's also inspired those judges on the global level. And so they are understanding what kind of remedy has to be put in place to save the planet. So um, that is atmospheric trust litigation, and I feel um, that that is just gaining tremendous momentum. But the other side is just as important because if we don't clean up the atmosphere, we still go towards runaway heating. In other words, there's that sort of oil spill in the atmosphere to contend with. That's how I look at it. So we still have to clean up the atmosphere and draw down carbon dioxide to about um, to uh, 350 parts per million, and that means drawing down actually over now 100 gigatons of carbon. Remember, <coughs> there are ways to jumpstart this effort um, through these, they're called natural climate solutions, using the Earth's own capacity, reviving natural ecosystems, and reviving ecosystems that have often been damaged, reclaiming them in, in, um, in this carbon effort. The problem is, no one's in charge of accomplishing drawdown. Literally, there's science all over the world, but there's no one accomplishing drawdown. There's a lot of pilot projects and science. And so what we've done um, through the Atmospheric Recovery Project out of the law school is we've devised a three-gear approach, trying to think of, well, how would we use the law to catalyze this huge atmospheric recovery effort? And um, the first most basic part is the world needs a cleanup plan. You know, you have a lot of scattered efforts, you've got great innovation, but we need to combine it and aggregate it into a plan and then carry it out. And so that's equivalent kind of to, um, to a sort of an oil cleanup plan. When oil is spilled in the ocean, you know, you don't just let it sit there. There's a cleanup plan and people implement it, right? And so this cleanup plan we're envisioning um, would entail soil-based drawdown, and it would have phase one domestic, fa uh, domestic US um, part, and then phase two would be projects around the world. And there's enormous co-benefits of this drawdown if it's done right. It enhances resiliency against climate change and provides local jobs and so forth. But who's going to pay for it? Well, who pays when there's an oil spill in the ocean? Who pays? Do you know? The oil companies pay, not the taxpayers. It's not a we do pay. You're right. It's the oil companies. The oil companies spilled. The oil companies pay. So um, this envisions uh, going after those vast fossil fuel industry profits 
through natural resource damage suits brought against the companies um, responsible for the spill of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So one of those gears is the legal gear. And it envisions, and I've written sort of an article that describes the pathway to this, it envisions a natural resource damage recovery suit against these carbon majors, which are Exxon and BP and so forth, um, to fund the atmospheric recovery plan. Who can bring this? States, counties, tribes, or foreign nations. President Trump could too, but he's very unlikely to. So um, who are the potentially responsible parties? It would be the carbon majors um, who produced the oil, coal, and natural gas. The claims would be, unfortunately there's no statutory provision allowing cleanup, so it would be a trust claim or common law tort claims. So we've talked about um, we need a plan. We can fund that plan through these actions brought against the fossil fuel industry. And then the last gear is the sky trust, which we're not really focused on yet in a big way, but once the damages come in from court, they can be put into a settlement fund <coughs> that we're just calling the sky trust for now. And the settlement fund would then collect the money and then implement it in projects in phase one and phase two around the world. So there are cases now kind of paving the way for this. Um, there's cases you've probably heard about in California um, against fossil fuel companies seeking disgorgement of profits. Um, the problem is they're not, um, they're not suing these oil companies to recover the atmosphere. They're suing the oil companies to fund seawalls. Now there's a big problem with funding seawalls. So San Francisco is sued, Oakland is sued, Richmond is sued, um, New York City is sued, um, Colorado filed suit actually last week, actually uh, several weeks ago, and then King County up in Washington also filed a separate suit. So now we've got a whole list of suits against the fossil fuel companies, and they're kind of paving the way for what I'm talking about, but the real problem is, what? They're asking for seawall payments, and there's not enough money in the world to pay for all the damage unleashed on this planet by the fossil fuel industry. We've got loss of life and property, we've got economic losses, we've got relocation expenses, we've got infrastructure damage, and we've got secondary natural resource damages to shorelines and fisheries and wildlife and forests and waterways. And so the only practical response in these courts has got to be, in my mind, funding atmospheric resource natural damages, natural resource damages. Because if the courts fund seawalls, the money's just gonna go to adaptation is going to be gone after the first few lawsuits, whereas this money could be leveraged in a huge <coughs> atmospheric recovery fund and inspire other private funders around the world to contribute to that fund and actually get this going. So that's what we're working on right now. There's also an environmental justice component to this because as cities line up to sue the fossil fuel companies, you know, you've got about five or six lawsuits right now but other communities don't have the money to line up and, and sort of get in line for their damages. And so um, it doesn't solve the climate problem and it causes an environmental justice concern. But nevertheless, it does pave the way, these cases do pave the way for major carbon uh, liability. There's a, court I'm watching, a case I'm watching very, very carefully. And it's in front of a remarkable judge down in California. He's a federal district court judge and basically um, he refused to send the case back to a state court, and it was Judge Alsa, and he has said the climate problem demands the most comprehensive view available. And he also said that there has to be a system to apportion responsibility. That particular case is asking for, an, oh, he also ordered a climate change tutorial in which he brought um, the lawyers into court and they had to basically instruct him on climate science. So this is a judge and a court I'm watching really carefully because this is a judge who signaled, I understand the problem, it's huge, it's complex, and the federal courts need to, to organize some sort of solution to it. Meanwhile, up in Oregon, that's where we are, um, the state of Oregon just took a, a phenomenal approach in another pollution context. And that is the state has sued Monsanto Company saying it's responsible for PCB pollution in Portland Harbor. And there's no statute that allows that suit. It's actually the same public trust type of approach that I have advocated for. Um, and so we're watching that case too. So now, um, and, and we'll turn the camera off and talk about more recent developments, but 
Um, so now that legal lever, these cases are paving the way and they're sort of a strategy. Um, but the other lever was that big atmospheric recovery plan and to get that going involves scientists. And so what we have proposed is to convene top thinkers, scientific thinkers, in a series of three or four workshops to start creating the concept of an atmospheric recovery plan and to sort of assemble the science that would be needed for that kind of plan and then establish from that group of scientists a prospectus for an atmospheric recovery institute that will actually oversee um, aggregating the scientists, serving as third party monitor and so forth. So um, with that you have a three-year strategy that I emphasize has not yet been launched. So it's two parts of the climate imperative. One is decarbonation, decarbonization, and atmospheric trust litigation is moving that. That's the Giuliana case, which I hope you all will attend. Um, the other part, though, is equally important. It's drawdown. It's less urgent. You have, don't have to accomplish all that in three years. But you have to get started. And drawdown can be accomplished through natural carbon solutions that really has no leadership, but we've got a three-gear sort of design strategy to use the courts as a catalyst to get that going. Once one gear moves, if that top legal gear moves, and watch for that, that top NRD moves, if that starts moving, then that creates the prospect for major financing of an atmospheric recovery plan. And that starts getting things going in a very big way. So to conclude, and then we'll open it for comments and questions, um, this is what uh, Jim Hansen, uh, Dr. Jim Hansen says about the judicial branch in the climate emergency. Judicial relief may be the best, the last, and at this late stage, the only real chance to preserve a habitable planet for young people and future generations. And so the law, while it has been um, dysfunctional up until now, could prove to be a catalyst moving forward. But I always want to emphasize, and I usually do this at the beginning, that don't wait for the law. <laughs> you know, this is everybody's challenge. It's a challenge for the engineers, for the business people, for the educators, for the medical profession, for absolutely everybody. Don't wait for the law. The only reason we're talking about the law right now is because I'm a law professor and I don't know how to design a battery. But if you design a battery, just leave the room right now and go to your work. <laughs> okay, um, with that, let's turn the camera off.